It's the Yukon Poly Popcast, a podcast where we talk about politics and popular culture. I'm Professor Stephen Dyson. I'm here with Professor Jeff Dudas. And Jeff, this is going to be a bit of a different one today. Um, I've done a thing. Yeah. Yes, you've done something cool. I did a thing. I'm not sure if it's cool, but I did it. it it's cool, and we're here to celebrate it. Yeah. So yeah. what I've done, Jeff, is I've published an um, article yep. in a journal called Extrapolation, which is a journal of um, science fiction studies. And uh, as you know, the the mean number of uh, readers of the of the mean academic article is yeah. is zero. So I thought <laughs> I would talk about it on YouTube exactly. to see if we can drive some interest towards this uh, th- this this piece of work that I've come up with. And uh, you know, I don't know if it's any good or if there's anything yeah. interesting to say about it. But I, but we're going to talk about it regardless. Exactly. As a friend of mine likes to say, this is a an essay that is widely unread. Yes. So <laughs> it's what one of my most unread <laughs> essays. <laughs> so we're here to to give it the light of day. Yes. So this is an article that is an article about a pretty central and important intellectual figure in the American Academy over the last generation, a guy called Francis Fukuyama. And the article is all about um, the maybe what we might call the collision of his interests between world politics and science fiction. And so I thought we would begin by talking about Francis Fukuyama. Who is Francis Fukuyama? Why is he important? And why is he somebody that people should know about? Yeah, um, I think he is very important. So the article is called Nightmares at the End of History, Francis Fukuyama's Encounters with Science Fiction. And Francis Fukuyama is a, um, well, now he's a public intellectual, a political theorist, works out at um, Stanford University. Um, his story sort of begins in the, the very late 1980s when he's an official in George H.W. Bush's mm-hmm. State Department. And he's, his sort of policy portfolio is observing the um, Soviet Union and its kind of puppet regimes in Eastern mm-hmm. Europe. And Fukuyama says that he effectively predicted the, the collapse of these regimes, um, you know, not decades ahead of everyone else, but he says he, uh, t- uh, there were lots of historical developments as these regimes sequentially collapsed, uh, you know, in the late 1980s and early 1990s, and he always thought he was six months to a year ahead of everyone else who was uh-huh. observing them. And the reason why he says that is that, in his judgment, the collapse of these regimes was not merely kind of a few authoritarian governments falling apart. It was not merely the sort of geopolitical victory of America and its allies, but it was really the, the manifestation of a victory in the realm of ideas. Yeah. And, and, and the Soviet Union and its puppet states had suffered a defeat in the realm of ideas. And he said, liberal democratic capitalism, as embodied in the United States and Western Europe, and Western Europe had triumphed finally and decisively, this was, this was the crucial part, over uh, uh, communism, which Fukuyama said was like the last standing ideological competitor to liberal democratic capitalism. And so he, he outlined this theory of a progress of history through different types of political systems that would be set in contest with one another and the final combat the, yep. the, the end stage what do they call them bosses in video games yes the, the end stage boss faced by um, liberal democratic capitalism was communism uh-huh. communism was vanquished uh, ipso dipso the only thing remaining is liberal democratic capitalism which had not which had won now and forever yes. hence the title of his famous article and book which really sort of blew up and he became this kind of intellectual megastar the end of history exactly and so this unsurprisingly his conclusions get read in a triumphalist celebratory manner um, that it's not simply that liberal capitalism has won out but that it's a good and right thing that liberal capitalism has won out and what's interesting about what you're doing here in this article is that you are making clear that even in that work the end of history there's a, a sort of a part appended to it towards the end in which Fukuyama voices some ambivalence about this advanced state of liberal capitalism that he evidences some concerns about what human life is like or could become like in this state um, and concerns that are not especially congenial to a, a celebration or triumphalist interpretation of the book as a whole. Um, but those bits get ignored, right? Yeah, yeah, there's... there's... <sighs> Fukuyama himself has said that the end of history, you know, the title is very well known, but the yeah. book is not well read. Mm-hmm. And I think that's that's broadly true. And as you say, there's 
it, this was received as a sort of we won the Cold War, yes. liberal democratic capitalism um, is is like terrific and through globalization it's mm-hmm. going to continue to to spread and people like Thomas Friedman of the New York mm-hmm. Times kind of jump on top of this and um, you know uh, uh, it's seen, his ideas are seen as kind of co- uh, coterminous with Fukuyama's and this is all tremendous. Fukuyama had said in both his, his book and, and the earlier article that actually there was a bit of a problem, which is life at the end of history was going to be pretty gloomy, mm. pretty boring. All you could really do is like shop. There, there were no greater causes to, to give oneself to yeah. of the kind that had driven historical progress in early eras. Mm. And so part of the story of what happens here is um, something that happens when quite complex ideas go into the public realm, mm. which, which is no one reads anything right. <laughs> except the title, and that, and that stands in for the whole argument. Partly, though... Um, I'm afraid it's Fukuyama's own fault yeah. because huge swathes of his argumentation are very triumphalist and he's, he's very kind of happy with and on board with the liberal democratic capitalist system as the best available and actually not only the best of a bad bunch but actually pretty terrific in its yeah. own right. And then there's... And the best that could ever be. And the best that can ever be and this is crucial. And then there's, there's this sort of really wrenching tone shift as you get towards the end again of both the book and the article where he starts talking about actually how rubbish <laughs> uh-huh. it, it, it's all going to be. And that creates you know, a real paradox that's really interesting. And it's a paradox that is only exemplified when Fukuyama goes on in his public intellectual life to be so drawn to uh, very famous works of science fiction. Exactly. That's exactly it. And so yeah. This is really the critical thrust of your article here, is the exploration of this strange tension, or what, what we might call a paradox in Fukuyama's thought, regarding the attractiveness of this end state of liberal capitalism, which you argue is um, a tension that is really made manifest and made especially clear in his science fiction fandom, and in particular in his um, besottedness with these dystopian types of stories. So when he gets attracted to dystopian types of stories, what does that mean? What is a dystopian story as opposed to maybe a utopian story. Yeah, exactly. So it's so it's a good question and, and there's a couple of ways to answer that. There's what there's what I think science fiction studies scholars would say about mm-hmm. this and then there's how Fukuyama seems to mm-hmm. seems to take it. I mean the background for this is um, Fukuyama gets invited by Slate magazine mm-hmm. to host a sort of mu- movie series, series of movie screens. Sounds pretty cool mm-hmm. actually, where they'd render space, uh-huh. you know, in a in a major city on the on the East Coast mm-hmm. and Fukuyama would come along and he'd give an introduction to a movie and then the audience would watch it and then he'd kind of field questions and answers. Um, and some of these introductions that he gave are available on uh, YouTube. I picked Children of Men uh, for another Future Tense showing uh, for a couple of reasons. So first of all, uh, it opens with this apocalyptic scene of Britain that has decided to deport all of the illegal aliens and essentially turn the island into a huge concentration camp. Uh, That's obviously something that should be on people's minds after Brexit and after the rise of Donald Trump and a lot of anti-immigrant sentiment. Uh, that was one issue, but beyond that, I think the movie, um, well, I, I love post-apocalyptic movies about how the human race ends, and this one poses a very interesting question about how much of our uh, thinking about our current lives is dependent on having a future. Um, he, he picked a series of movies, he did this over a number of years, picked a series of movies that are pretty similar to one another. Mm-hmm. Um, they all kind of take place on a on an Earth in the near future. Mm-hmm. Um, they all kind of focus on really interesting questions of philosophy and government, and they're all uh, dystopias. Yeah. And dystopia meaning a uh, society, um, often though not necessarily in the in, in the future, uh, that is sort of relatable to our own, like mm-hmm. cognizable as mm-hmm. as our own. It's not just some weird space aliens, you know, right. who have no relationship to us. Um, but that is different from our own and organized on different sort of political and social principles than our own. And a dystopia is one that is markedly worse yes. <laughs> than our own. And a utopia, by contrast, is, is a society that's markedly better. And so Fukuyama um, hosts showings of uh, Blade Runner, Children of Men, Mad Max, and those three are the yeah. ones that you can find uh, most extensively right. as commentary. And so they're, they're the major focus of my article. Yeah. 
also related movies, Gattaca, you know, which was yeah. about kind of genetic engineering, yeah. Silent Green, you yeah. know, the, the food is, it's people, and um, another, mm-hmm. another dystopia. Brave so the, New World. Yeah, bra- yeah, yeah, exactly. But you know, what's interesting about the, the texts that you analyze here, that Fukuyama seems especially drawn to, Children of Men, Mad Max, and uh, Blade Runner, is that their dystopian is a society in decline, right? As opposed to something like Brave New World. Right, which is a society that, uh, as I read that text or as I envision that text, it's really about kind of the dark dystopian undercurrents of a utopian, an otherwise utopian society. Um, here, that's not the case, right? We we have a, in each of these texts, these are societies that are at the end. In, in a way, they are. This is a, a, these are texts about the end of history, in a similar way, right? And certainly, that's how Fukuyama seems to envision these texts as well. Now. As you were talking about dystopias, it strikes me that, and you had led with this, that how science fiction scholars see dystopias tend to be different than how Fukuyama envisions them. So what is that difference? Yeah, um, so Fukuyama, it is apparent from his introductions to these to these works and, and the commentary that you can find about, the, about what he says about them, sees you know, Blade Runner, Children of Men in particular. Mm. Mad Max is a tiny bit different, but, you know, fits the general argument. As images of um, a liberal democratic capitalist society 50 years, you know, in the future, um, that has declined. And he reads dystopias as a sort of warning. Mm -hmm. And so he's got this theory of our present day, which is this is this is organized as well as it can be liberal democratic capitalism we're in a pretty good place okay yeah. not perfect but it's as good as it could be these fictional images of society's 50 years in the future things have gone wrong yeah. it's a warning therefore what we should do in the present day is really like jealously protect our institutions um, jealously protect uh, our environment jealously protect those things that have gone wrong in Blade Runner and Children of Men. So be careful of um, kind of cloning technologies, or or actually, you know, more more broadly, very solidly police the boundaries between real and artificial, and and what's natural to a human and what's artificial. Mm-hmm. Because if we don't, we're going to end up with like replicants in the Blade Runner universe, and that was worse. That's a worse society than today. We're also going to like have destroyed the environment, which also happens in Blade Runner. Mm-hmm. Um, be very careful about you know uh, questions of population decline, yeah. but also questions of having um, uh, spiritual purpose, yes. which is which are the themes of Children of Men, which is a society in which. Uh, an end to fertility has led to a sort of general ennui because no one has any future yeah. to live for and so everything descends into sort of lassitude. And so they're, they're conservative in the, in the literal meaning of the word readings of these texts. Yes. We're in a good shit, we're in, we're in a good place, protect it or this will happen. Mm-hmm. Which is sort of the, it's a not uncommon understanding of what a dystopia is, a sort of scenario mm-hmm. of the future in which something's gone wrong that we, that we should worry about. I think for a science fiction studies scholar, you'd look at the dystopia, and and often the word is used, critical dystopia. Um, You'd look at the dystopia not as a warning that argues for preservation of the present, but as an active critique of the present. And so something like Blade Runner, Children of Men, Mad Max, they're not warnings to preserve present liberal democratic capitalism. They're incisive critiques of the dangers of present liberal democratic capitalism if it's not radically changed. Uh-huh. The commodification of personhood, um, the environmental destruction, the spiritual hollowing out that comes, and the chance of, of, of just absolute catastrophe, yeah. such as happens in Mad Max. Mm-hmm. And therefore they are intended to a science fiction studies scholar, not as conservative arguments for doing nothing, they're intended as activist arguments to sort of gin up a progressive energy yeah. in the present day to say, look, this is the dark mirror, mm-hmm. not of a possible future, but of our present society. Yeah. And, and therefore, they're explicitly progressive, not conservative texts. And this is, I think, I mean, Fukuyama is entitled to whatever, anyone is entitled to whatever interpretation of any piece of art they wish. Fukuyama's conservative interpretation of these dystopias is consistent with, I think, his general ideology. Mm-hmm. But it does sort of reinforce this paradox <laughs> mm-hmm. that, that he's got this view of the present day as 
on, on the one hand, brilliant, yeah. and certainly the best that can possibly be achieved, because history has ended. But on the other hand, quite gloomy and quite negative. Yes. And he's thawed himself into a corner, and the critical dystopia to a science fiction study scholar offers you a way out of this mm -hmm. corner, but that requires that history is not ended, that, that this isn't the final system, exactly. it needs to be changed rather radically. And I think it's meaningful that in these kinds of dystopias, including in the stories that Fukuyama is interested in, there are explicit moments of renewal and rebirth at the end of these stories. We don't know what's going to happen in the future, but what we do know is there is a future and it will necessarily be different than the one out of which the characters have have just come, out of the present out of which the characters have just come. So uh, it's, simply, it's not just the choice of de the texts that Fukuyama is interested in, it's also the particular interpretation that he's giving, which leans into a kind of very surface, dour, and, and kind of catastrophic reality that seems to miss the, the kind of critical bite of the story itself. And I should say for, for viewers, The Last of Us would be an example of this kind of dystopian story. Um, and while we don't know how it's gonna end, my strong suspicion is that it's gonna be in the critical dystopian, uh, leaning into acts of renewal and yeah. rebirth as well. See our last video. Yes. <laughs> is, is the Indeed. sort of an unsubtle uh, <laughs> direction of traffic there. So, it, I mean, this is, so it's very interesting the way in which your article is able to shed new light upon a, a thinker who was explicitly interested in real world policy matters and, you know, and interested in arguably the most important global phenomenon of the 20th century, which is the Cold War. But what we learned from your analysis is that to really dig into the depths of the, the tensions that Fukuyama feels in his political project, you kind of have to get interested or at least pay attention to the things that he's interested in that are not policy related. You have to get interested in the ways that he's interested in storytelling and that there's a kind of emotional character that, and, and maybe even his own ennui that we can begin to detect by paying attention to the, the stories that he's interested yeah, in. Yeah, yeah, and I think the, you know, it was my hope in <clears throat> in writing the article, mm -hmm. and there was also, um, I had the chance to contribute a, a sort of related piece um, to, a, to a forum on the end of history. Mm -hmm. God, what was it, th 35 years later, 30 years? I actually forget the date, 30 years later yeah. in the journal Polity, yeah. to which Fukuyama responded. Mm -hmm. um, it, it was my hope in saying these things to, I mean, this sounds like immodesty, why would you ever read anything <laughs> that I was interested in? But I, w I, was, I was rather saddened by this box in which he kind of thawed himself, because mm -hmm. I like The End of History, I think, is a very provocative and interesting book, and I like this story of uh, human development driven by, it, by human agency and our desire to be, you know, recognized as full human beings and our kind of conquering of the natural world through, um, through science. Mm -hmm. And these are all, you know, really interesting ideas that I think anyone who's interested in a progressive society and eventually a utopia likes those kind of theories of history. I think, I, I just thought it was very sad that Fukuyama thought we'd stopped mm -hmm. and we'd reached the, reached the apex point. And so I would like to, you know, offer him a way out of this kind of thinking box. And I thought we by, by referencing his own favorite, avowed favorite texts. Right. And, and you'd said something like, but you know, the, these Blade Runner children of men, Mad Max in particular, yeah. are not pure dystopias. They, they all have an arc that points mm -hmm. towards something else, some more utopian mm -hmm. thinking. So, so the story of Blade Runner is um, Roy Baddy, the kind of leader of, of a, a newly emergent or newly conscious class interest <laughs> amongst the replicants, essentially outlining theories of revolution mm -hmm. that, will, that will allow the replicants to embody their full, or, or to claim their full rights. And at the same time, the sort of um, alienated protagonist, which is very common in the dystopia, the, the sort of downtrodden, gin-sodden old chap, Rick Deckard, is yeah. led from um, apathy and ennui mm -hmm. by Roy Baddy, so somewhat violently led, but nonetheless, uh -huh. towards his own kind of awakening to a to a, a, a sort of great pan humanism, you know. And at the end of Blade Runner, Baddy gives that you know Baddy acts selflessly to save Deckard's life, yeah. and and gives that great speech about what what his life has been about and the things that he's seen in it. And even though it was artificially curtailed, he's, he's sort of the value of of his experiences. I'm 
see things you people wouldn't believe. <laughs> Attack ships on fire off the shore of Orion. I watched sea beams glitter in the dark near the ten hours of game. And, you, you know, I, I think the way to read that ending is not we should act in a conservative way to preserve boundaries between the real and artificial and we're, we're all in favour of commodification of personhood. It, it's that there is a different way possible. Yeah. Same in Children of Men, you know, that Theo, the protagonist, begins Children of Men as gin sodden, old, older, kind of alienated yeah. protagonist and he's led by um, Key, the young woman who, who becomes pregnant, um, on a journey towards a more progressive, cosmopolitan... Yeah. Um, Humanism mm -hmm. that, that, that at the end is a, I mean the, the last scene of the movie is this kind of uh, ship on the sea that that, that Theo uh, ferries key towards mm -hmm. <laughs> that, that has a person pointing like this with tomorrow <laughs> yeah. is the name of the ship I mean it can't be more literal yeah. about about what it's trying to point to yeah. again doesn't seem like a conservative text right. even in Mad Max there's always the flourishing of new human communities at the end of these mm -hmm. stories and rather crucially that you know some of these new human communities look like they're gonna replicate some of the political forms yeah. of the past and Max is always like, no thanks, I'm, I'm just going to go off on my own, I'm not going to fully commit to this, there are different ways of living that are possible. And it did seem that w within within even the, the sort of ambit of the text Fukuyama has selected, there's so much more utopian potential that would specifically help him out of the, this awful trap that he's, that he's kind of found himself in. Or at least each of those texts, if they don't offer any kind of a blueprint, mm -hmm. right? And, and I think arguably some of them do. Just the very notion that things go on, yeah, this isn't the end, right. is very much at odds with how Fukuyama is reading those texts, yeah. Yeah. and very much at odds, as you say, with his kind of policy vision, his ideological vision as well, yeah. which emphasizes the finality of the current circumstances. Right. Yeah, and I think the way to, the way to read these texts and the way to approach a lot of science fiction, when you're interested in these questions of dystopia and utopia, mm -hmm. is to kind of forget the ideas of blueprints, of, of yeah. fully realized perfect societies being presented. That's kind of, I'm afraid, a, a sort of slightly outdated view yeah. of, of what a utopian line of thought mm -hmm. would be. Um, I think you have to see them as kind of uh, suggestions or provocations, mm -hmm. or I mean, or the, the, the term that's often used is like a hermeneutic, a, yeah. a, way, of, a way of reading and thinking yeah. about political life that isn't going to give you all the answers, right. but it is going to give you some questions to ask. Mm -hmm. And it is rather crucially going to say, we're not finished. You can't just declare an end. Yeah. Just declaring an end is an arbitrary act yeah. that, that is sort of doomed to, to failure. Mm -hmm. Unless you're at a fully specified utopia, which you can only recognize what it is as it arrives it's never going to be visible yeah. you know on, along the journey because the journey is revealing new ways to kind of improve uh, human society and human politics and so forth unless you're at that end point which has to be a utopia you mm -hmm. can't declare an end so to declare an end point with a, with a set of socio-political arrangements that you yourself acknowledge are a bit crap yeah. Yeah. <laughs> is, 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 is an odd thing to have done, yeah. I think. Yeah. And I, what's so interesting about this article and about this kind of scholarly project is the way, again, that it allows us to have a, a critical entry point into a, a kind of conventional political thinker through unconventional means. And it, it's the sort of project that opens up a lot of the kinds of vistas, scholarly vistas, that the study of politics and popular culture in general opens up, right? This notion that we live not only in our ordinary material interactions with one another, but that we live in the story, as, as the author Grant Morrison says, we live in the stories that we tell ourselves. We live in the stories that we tell each other. And so I, I think I just wanted to, to conclude maybe with... With an advertisement. Yeah, well... <laughs> With, with making clear, right? No, it's a good faith advertisement. The, the kind of stuff correct. That, that this program means to do, the master's degree in politics and popular culture. At UConn. At UConn. Um, but it also, it opens, I think, different kinds of, of scholarship, right, that maybe is not open. It's a way of thinking through the, uh, I don't know, the inefficacy the or the, the, the sort of the... Um, 
not the spiritual, but the you know the the intangible moments of life that yep. are frequently very difficult to model or to count, right? right? Um, but exist nonetheless, yep. and are critically important ways in which human beings make sense of our experiences with one another. Yes, um, those kinds of questions and influences are really open to this kind of approach to studying culture. Yeah, hundred percent, and that's what that's what our program yeah. does. And we'll put a link to the program in the. In the description, they're they're really the the questions that I think drive me and you both yeah. in our, our scholarly work, and we've talked about one example of that today, and the yeah. and the classes we teach and so forth, and also uh, kind of drive some of the inquisitions we do on this Absolutely. on this YouTube channel. Yeah, yeah. So, I th is, uh, is there anything else you want to ask me about my tremendously um, low profile it's, academic article? It's definitely article? going to be less widely unread now. Yes. <laughs> Markedly less yes. widely unread yes. after this. Well, thank you. I appreciate the, um, the, the modest platform <laughs> <laughs> which, we, which we've created yes. today. And I think uh, on that bombshell, 